Good morning and welcome to Monday Mornings with Margie. Um, glad to be back. Uh, hope you're all doing well. And I have another wonderful guest on today, uh, Julie Johnson, who is going to introduce herself to all of us. Welcome, Julie. Hi, Margie. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm Julie Johnson. I am a licensed mental health counselor here in Iowa in the Midwest. Uh, and I am the owner and founder of Heart and Solutions. We are a strength-based counseling agency here in Iowa. Uh, we have nine physical locations across the state. Uh, and then we do outpatient mental health counseling in our offices and in our school districts. Uh, but then we also do behavioral health counseling for children in home and in school. Um, oh, wow. And so we, we serve about 500 uh, families, individuals, children, adults uh, throughout each week. Um, and our goal is to bring mental health care uh, to more of the forefront here in Iowa. And uh, I'm also the host, co-host of the You Need a Counselor podcast. Uh, so you can find that on YouTube if you want to watch the video. Uh, but if you're interested in the audio, you can listen to that on Spotify or anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Uh, and I am also uh, I'm married. I am the mother of a almost six-year-old. She's coming up on this already. Uh, and so she is starting kindergarten. She has just started kindergarten this year. Uh, and yeah, so I am, I would love to share uh, any pieces of that, professional pieces of that, uh, personal pieces of that, uh, whatever seems most interesting to, uh, or would be beneficial to your listeners. Sure. So you, you have a pretty busy life then, I would say. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> You have a busy life. I am. Uh, I'm currently getting my doctorate in behavioral health leadership. Um, fingers crossed. I in two months exactly on November thirtieth, I will have my doctorate. Wow. Um, so that is, that's been a long process. Three years with you know my my daughter was two and a half when I started that process, um, and everybody said, "What are you doing?" Why would you <laughs> Why, why would you ever start a doctorate with, with a two and a half year old in your house? Um, people said that to me, including my husband, uh, and he was right. Uh, at the same time, uh, I'm just glad that it's almost over two months left. I can see the finish line. I'm going, okay, I'm ready, ready to do this. Yeah. Um, I also, uh, thank you. I also uh, self-published children's books. And so um, I've got a children's book on uh, breathing techniques for uh, five years old and younger. My daughter helped me write. Uh, and these are basically just the breathing techniques that I used with her uh, when she was one and a half to uh, all the way up to she still uses them when she needs help calming down uh, in certain situations. And they're all holiday themed. Um, so it's called Breathing Through the Year uh, by Julie Johnson. And if you go on YouTube, you can see uh, videos of my three-year-old and four-year-old daughter and five years old now uh, throughout the years demonstrating these breathing techniques uh, on YouTube as well for any kiddos that might watch that. Very interesting. That's great. Um, so today I wanted to focus in a little bit um, on a couple things that you and I were talking about. Um, and one of the main topics you talked about being postpartum um, is not really something I've necessarily covered um, on my podcast, but I know how critical of a topic it is to address um, and for people to understand. And with that being said, I thought maybe once we talk a little bit about that, then maybe we could talk a little bit about for somebody struggling, you know, with postpartum or with some kind of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, um, in general, who need help, how does one get help and what does the process look like? Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what you know, either personally or professionally um, about postpartum depression and anxiety? Yeah. Um, yeah, I will say I can share my story uh, personally as a I always think I'm a new mom, but I'm she's almost six. So I'm not really <laughs> a new mom anymore. I'm a new ish mom. Um, but yeah, I, I had um, 
I had struggled with uh, infertility for about four years uh, prior to getting pregnant with my daughter. So uh, my husband and I got married uh, and we thought, okay, let's let's just be married for a year and then we'll we'll start uh, trying to have a family. And uh, and so we we started trying to have a family. And then a year later, nothing was happening. A year after that, a year after that, and a year after that. Um, and I think like so many uh, moms, you know, or or so many uh, people who are looking to become moms or dads or parents. Um, there is, we're busy, right? So sometimes those things kind of fly by. And before I knew it, uh, it had been three years and we, we were still not pregnant. And so, uh, and then I started to get worried. And uh, I think that that worry um, comes in. And, and when, you're, when you're going through infertility, it feels like everybody you know is pregnant or everybody you know is getting pregnant. I remember uh, going to a birthday party and uh, it was a, a birthday party for a two-year-old and the, the parents of the two-year-old, our friends at the party announced, hey, we're good news, we're expecting again. Um, and you know, they're gonna have a little brother and I had to leave the party. I couldn't, be, I was at the point where I couldn't even be happy for people. You know, I would see somebody would let me know, uh, you know, over text, hey, we're, we're expecting. And I, I couldn't even be happy. I could say the things, um, but I couldn't feel joy for them. And so I think that um, because there's a lot of comparison uh, for people and there's a lot of expectation, I think, around especially newlyweds. I think that newlyweds get a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> a family right and and as soon as you get married it's well when are when are you having a kid when are you starting a family uh and then once you have one uh you get about a year leeway and then people start asking when are you having your next one <laughs> um and so there is a lot of pressure around that uh so we ex we experienced that and then uh we did become pregnant and uh it was a very very difficult pregnancy um i had preeclampsia uh, which I had never, ever heard of before. So I had preeclampsia uh, and I had to go in for ultrasounds every single week and stress tests every single week. Um, it was extremely difficult and it was extremely dangerous uh, pregnancy at the end of it. Mm. And so, but I, but I was so, after going through all of that time of infertility, I was so excited and happy that I was going to, to have this baby that it was almost like I felt like I needed to suppress any uh, challenging feelings or, or uncomfortable feelings about the pregnancy itself and about, you know, my, my daughter coming into the world and what was I going to do and how was I going to be as a mom. Um, it almost felt ungrateful at times, which my rational brain says, what? I can feel however I want. Um, however, I know that it's very common after infertility especially, um, to feel like, well, this is my miracle baby, right? Everything needs to feel perfect. I need to feel great about this. Uh, and so I had my daughter, beautiful, wonderful, healthy. Uh, and then we come home and I didn't sleep for a week. And, and people kind of say that about newborns sometimes, um, like, oh man, I haven't slept in forever, but I, I would stand next to her bed, there, so she had her crib. I would stand next to the crib. I had a mattress on the floor, uh, a roll out mattress on her floor where I thought, well, I'll, I'll sleep in there around the, the mattress. Never unrolled the mattress. I would just stand next to her crib and stare at her and put my hand on her chest. Is she breathing, right? I'd put my hand kind of like on her head. Does she feel warm? Um, and I thought that was normal because, you know, I'm a new mom, right? And the thing about being an, a parent for the first time to any child, even if you're to your 10th child, being a new mom to that child or being a new parent or caregiver for that child is a brand new experience every single time. And so it's very easy to discount, or it was for me, it was very easy to discount a lot of those things that were causing me distress. Mm -hmm. I was distressed standing next to her bed. Um, and on, on our podcast, we talk a lot about distress as, a, as an indicator for us, right? Uh, that could have been a totally, when we talk about normal, that could have felt totally normal for me to stand next to her bed if I wasn't feeling distressed about it, right? Mm -hmm. So the piece that made it uh, a, 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 
a problem or something that I wanted to actively work on. And, and I call those an active project. So the thing that made it an active project was that I was feeling distress while I was doing it. Now, if I was standing next to her crib and watching her 24 hours a day and, you know, checking her breathing and feeling her temperature, but I was feeling joyful about it, right? Or I was feeling even neutral. About it, okay. Um, but I was feeling distressed. Right? I was doing it because of distress. And so uh, I remember not sleeping, standing in front of her crib. Um, I remember when I would have to go downstairs to uh, either to like put pumped breast milk in the fridge, right? Or, or bring up a, a new bottle or do anything like even to like feed myself, right? Go downstairs to the fridge, get some tea. I would feel as though, and I, and I remember the feeling, feeling as though I was harming my daughter, right? That I was putting her into, it felt like she was sitting, instead of laying in her crib fast asleep, it felt like she was on a cliff <laughs> and I was going downstairs to get tea, sure. right? Um, and so I, I remember those such intense feelings, but I think that as a, as a society, before I was a mom, I didn't know what it was like to be a caretaker for a child. Um, I also don't have any younger siblings, right? So I had zero basis of comparison. And I think that's the case with any new caregiver, right? Whether it's through adoption, what I'm adopted, my parents uh, tell me lots of stories about when I was first adopted because it's brand new to us. Um, you know, so I remember these feelings and I had never, I had never considered that I would have postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so I, growing up as a child, I had social anxiety. Um, growing up as a child, I had uh, some, some generalized anxiety. Uh, so I was kind of used to that. And so the idea that I, and so I thought, well, I might be susceptible to postpartum depression, right? I might, I might have some of those symptoms and I was kind of prepare, preparing myself for that, creating my supports around me for that. Um, we talked a lot about that in, in my uh, mom's group. And so I was feeling comfortable with that. I'm in the field. I'm going, okay, I'm feeling good here. Postpartum anxiety came at me like a brick wall. I had no idea that this is what it was going to be like. Um, I wasn't, it wasn't on my radar, postpartum anxiety. Um, and I think for a lot of people, when we think about new parents, um, and by the way, it's not just um, moms, right, that experience this. So new caregivers of all kinds um, experience this, this kind of anxiety afterwards. And it doesn't get talked about hardly ever, right? How often do we hear the term right. postpartum right. anxiety? And how often do we hear the terms postpartum psychosis? Right. Hardly ever, right? right. We, we never, we hear baby blues, right? They used to call it. And uh, we, you know, we hear these, these terms. And, and I think that it's because, you know, there is national uh, media coverage sometimes on postpartum depression mm -hmm. because it, there's that danger element, right? For the child. And so it does get more, publicity, it does get uh, talked about, and there are more discussions about it, trying to prep parents for that. Mm. Um, postpartum psychosis is way more common <laughs> than I thought. No, I didn't experience postpartum psychosis, but postpartum anxiety, I was not prepared for. Um, nobody told me about that. And when I, when I speak uh, on other platforms or uh, at conferences and I talk and I bring up postpartum anxiety, a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't put that together, but I experienced that. I felt that, right? Yeah. And, and we think it's just our hormones kicking in. We think it's just sure. our instincts kicking in, but it's that distress, mm -hmm. right? If we, of course, we have nurturing feelings towards our children, of course sure. we, right? Um, but if we're feeling distressed about it, that's where it becomes an active plan. It and it fun. sounds too like also there becomes like an irrational piece. Part of what's causing the distress is the irrational thoughts, oh. like the going downstairs, but feeling like you're harming your baby who's totally 100% fine in the crib. Um, but you having those irrational thoughts that um, increase that level of distress. Absolutely. And, you know, my brain five and a half years later can say, 
that was an irrational thought, right? I can, I can say, hey, when I would pick up my daughter and I would feel like, what if I faint, right? What if I pass, there was yeah. no reason that I would pass out, but what if I do, she's gonna hit her head on the crib, right? So my yeah. brain would go there and five and a half years later, I can go, yeah, there was no reason to think that I was going to pass out, right? Or that she was going to be harmed while I went downstairs to make tea. Um, but in that moment, it is so hard to identify those irrational thoughts. And so one key with those is sharing those thoughts, trying to say those thoughts out loud or trying to text those thoughts to another person. And so of course, a therapist, a, a trained mental health counselor is a really great person to share those thoughts with because the thing about sharing those thoughts or saying those thoughts out loud to somebody else is that that also terrified me. Right. So I wasn't my my husband could see what I was doing, but he had no idea what was going on in here. Right. And so and the idea of saying those things, even to my husband. Right. And he knows now. But in that moment, they felt like either he was going to say, well, yeah, of course you feel that way. Right. You're she's a delicate little thing. Of course you feel that. So I thought that either he was going to say, well, yeah, everybody feels that way. Or he was going to be afraid for her as well, right? Mm -hmm. That I was going to spread (laughs) my my feelings to him um, or my fears about like sharing those thoughts and feelings with my friends, right? That they were going to, to one, either say, oh, that's normal. Everybody does that. And part of me was like, not normal it's not feeling normal um but either that they would they they would kind of do it that way or um that it would kind of intensify it right and and also sometimes I just didn't even know that I was having a problem (laughs) there was anything to actively be doing something about and so uh but saying those things out loud to a therapist that person is not in love with your child the way that your partner is the way that your parents are the way that you know your extended family is they have no investment other than the safety of your child Mm -hmm. Uh, they have no investment in what you do what you're thinking around that child and so they can help you if it's postpartum anxiety based they can help you to sort out those feelings and sometimes when we just say it out loud even if there's no therapist in the room (laughs) we go oh am I really thinking am I really feeling that you know and that's one of the the biggest benefits I think of seeing a mental health counselor and honestly I I recommend even for people who are either doing family planning now right? Um, Or if you are planning to have a child, either through pregnancy, through surrogacy, if you're adopting a child, that now is a great time to start that process. Because the idea of starting mental health counseling, even on the phone, so at the time that right now, telehealth is all over and telehealth is so much more available uh, for, for new parents who are at home with their children. Mm-hmm. But uh, just the idea of starting a new relationship at the time that I was already beginning and developing the most important relationship in my life was very, very overwhelming. And I'm a, I'm a therapist, right? So I know it's important. I know that it's useful. Um, and so, you know, luckily, I was already in, I've been in therapy since I was 13. Um, and so, and because I, I know that it helps. I know that it helps me. I know that it helps other people. And so uh, for I, I felt fortunate that, you know, I've already got this person and we already have a relationship. But the idea of building a new relationship at that time of life is very overwhelming. And so, you know, you, you see parents who uh, are expecting a child in eight months and they sign them up for the preschool waiting list, right? They sign them up for pre-K waiting list. Um, And I think that starting a relationship with a therapist, you are about to go through so many changes. And not only does our life and our our schedule change the way that, you know, we kind of initially might think about, yeah, I might get less sleep than I used to. My Mm -hmm. schedule is going to be different. Um, But our identities are changed. 
Um, and our relationships with our family members have changed. Uh, so even our, our parents, our siblings, um, they're now grandparents to our children. That's a whole new uh, piece of our relationship. And so there are going to be all of these changes. Um, and so I, I always kind of recommend doing that, starting that work early um, so that once you are in that position, once that new child comes into your life, you've already got that established relationship built. It can take three months. It can take six months. It can take a year to feel comfortable with your mental health therapist, right? And to really be able to say some of those things that it was hard for me to say to anybody, right? Um, so laying that foundation, I always think is, is a great thing to do. And just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying about the sort of reaching out and establishing um, a therapeutic relationship with a mental health counselor sort of ahead of time, the other aspect of things that I think really changes um, and becomes really sort of highlighted is the co-parenting. And um, often, one of the things that causes stress in people's relationships is they're not on the same page with co-parenting. Mm -hmm. um, and so doing some work also between uh, the couple is also, I think, extremely helpful. And, and also one thing that I noticed um, in becoming a parent and, and I became a parent through adoption, um, is that, and I see it with people who give birth to babies, like everybody is an expert on how you should do things. Yeah. And everyone feels like they're entitled to tell you their opinion. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you are in any kind of distress and you have people telling you what to do or how to do it, or you're doing it wrong, or it's not good enough, you know, whatever the case is, um, that can cause you even more distress. But if you have that connection to a therapist and you also have a solid foundation with your partner who you're co-parenting with, I feel like you can filter some of that out or you can come up with some kind of standard lines. Like I appreciate your thoughts, your feedback, this is how we've decided to do this, you know? Um, and so I think there's so many layers to what you're saying about what can be helpful um, to you as an individual, uh, to the couple, um, and ultimately to the child who's being, you know, raised by these two people, but with this extended group around them, friends and family who love and care about them and want the best for them as well. So... Mm -hmm. For all those reasons, I think you're like right on the mark. Um, and then if you add in postpartum depression or anxiety or psychosis, now you've just magnified everything times 10. Um, and, and you're right, having that person who you can share those thoughts with and trust enough to share those thoughts is so key because many times people know on some level that what they're thinking is probably off and may have some shame around it um, in sharing it. So needing to feel like you can bounce it off of someone who's not gonna judge you, but is gonna help you sort it through, I think is critical. Yeah. So I 100% agree with you on everything you said. Absolutely. I, I love what you're saying about, you know, co-parenting because yeah, uh, you know, the top uh, contentious issues and causes of divorce rate are money issues uh, and child raising issues and then religion, right? And so those, that is one of the number one uh, challenges for any couple. Mm -hmm. um, and mm, a lot of places that do weddings. Uh, I'm, I'm a wedding officiant also. I don't require that people do couples counseling before I marry them, but I highly recommend it. Um, yeah. But a lot of officiants, right, whether they're uh, non-denominational or not, a lot of officiants will require marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. And there's 
there's nothing like that <laughs> for when you add to your family. Um, and so, you know, I think that that I love that kind of connection there because, yeah, it is up to us. We have to do it. Um, and once our, you know, child comes into our home, we're not always in a place to start that relationship, to start those conversations mm -hmm. with our partner. So it, it is really, really great when we can preemptively. And, you know, it's it's not just when we add uh, children to our family. I think for all situations that come up, I have no idea what tomorrow brings, right? Mm -hmm. And so my life tomorrow could look completely different than my life today. We just never know. And tomorrow's not promised. We just don't know. And so I am never going to know. I can't mark on my calendar when I'm going to need a, a professional's help, when I'm going to need a relationship with a mental health counselor. I have no idea. This week, I might be feeling great and I might be doing great. Um, but next week, something could change in my life. And in that moment of, you know, a surprise loss, right, where we don't know that it's coming, in that moment of those changes to our identity, to our lives, it's, it's one of the most challenging times to start counseling mm -hmm. and to start that process because we're just not there because we're, we're either grieving, right, or we're going through, um, through these challenges in our lives. And so um, I, I always recommend just to, to start the relationship, even if it's, hey, I'm just going to meet with this person every other week, or I'm going to meet with this person every three weeks, just to be creating that relationship so that when I do need that support, when I do need that help, I've already got somebody established mm -hmm. and I'm ready to then dig in and do the work as opposed mm -hmm. to starting that process from right. the very beginning. Right, right. So in talking about, um, you know, uh, someone, let's just say um, someone that was in your position who didn't have um, someone and they're needing to, to look or get a therapist to help them, yeah. can you just do, a, you know, it doesn't have to be long, but a brief walkthrough on sort of like, what would somebody do who is in that position to sort of access the help they need um, and move forward with that. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're in that position or any position where you find, oh, I need um, some support right now. I need somebody who is not going to give me advice. I need somebody who doesn't have, you know, a horse in the race of my life um, to, to be able to talk to and process through with. Um, there are several ways to get connected for mental health counseling. Um, and a lot of times people think that they need a referral from a doctor, that they think that they need a referral from um, some other organization. You can always self-refer yourself for mental health counseling, okay? Um, so Psychology Today is a really, really great resource for locating counselors in your zip code. Um, if you go to psychologytoday.com, put your zip code in and put your insurance type in there. Uh, you can search by uh, by your demographics and your age, your, uh, your presenting challenge. Um, you can also sort the providers, right? If you're more comfortable uh, meeting with somebody who has more experience in a certain topic or a certain situation, um, then you can sort that way as well. Uh, you'll get to see pictures and contact information and bios. A lot of times people are putting photos of their office as well, um, which is really nice because it does overcome one of those barriers, at least um, to starting therapy, which a lot of times is, oh my gosh, I got to find this I got to park my car, right? I have to dig, are there mirrors? Yeah, yeah. I mean, those are all real challenges um, yeah, to coming into therapy, just the logistics of it, or what is this office going to look like? Can I picture myself in it before I go so that I feel a little bit more comfortable? Um, mm -hmm. Some providers on there have little videos of themselves, um, just introducing themselves and talking about their background so you can kind of get a little sense of how that person presents as well. Um, so Psychology Today is a really, really great resource. I always recommend that. Um, your family doctor too, If you now you don't need a referral from your doctor. You can call in and get scheduled yourself. Um, but if you, if you don't find somebody on Psychology Today there uh, in your zip code, 
And I would say contact your family doctor's office and ask them, who do you recommend in this area? Uh, they can give you some names and phone numbers. You can give them a call and get started. Um, I would say for that first phone call, make sure you uh, have your insurance card with you. I think that trips up a lot of people about like, what do I need to do when I call in to get mm -hmm. What are they going to ask me? Um, the biggest thing that, that kind of is a hindrance for people is not having their insurance card with them. So if you want to feel really prepared, like, okay, I'm, I know what they're going to kind of ask. Most information that they're likely to ask you, you're going to have off the top of your head about yourself. Okay. Um, right. The insurance card is the biggest one where people are like, because honestly, if you asked me for what my insurance number, I have no idea. It's downstairs. I have no clue. Okay. So just having that information kind of available to you. Um, if it's your child, they might ask for your child's social security number. Um, so things like that, just having that, again, I don't, if you ask me my daughter's social security number, I have no idea, but I know exactly where it is. So I know if I'm going to call in right. to, to a place, I'm going to gather that information first. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the other thing I like to warn people is once you go into a mental health counseling agency, you're likely to get an assessment as your first appointment. And those assessments can turn a lot of people off. Um, they, feel, they can feel very impersonal. Um, they can feel like, okay, I just met you and you're asking me a ton of questions about my life. Like, who do you think you are, um, they, can, they can feel that way. And so um, I, I would encourage you, if you do experience that, just know that that, that is part of it, um, that diagnostic assessment, but you are able, as, as the person who is gaining that support, you are able to say, you have every right to say, whoa, we need to slow down a little bit, <laughs> okay? Can I get to know you a little bit first before you start digging into my past, <laughs> right? And that is your right. And I think people don't know that as much, right? Because we, we talk about, you know, as, as medical patients, right? That if my doctor, uh, if I disagree with my doctor, a lot of times that's discouraged in a medical setting, right? I, I always hear like nurses will say, oh, they read WebMD, they think they're an expert on whatever it is. And so I've been discouraged by that, um, going to a medical provider and saying, here's what it is, here's some things. Um, and, you know, there's, there's kind of a negative connotation with that, or, or at least I've experienced that. With mental health counseling, you, you are well within your rights, and I want people to hear that, to say, whoa, please slow this down, but I'm not comfortable answering that question. Um, and also to pick your provider. So so, so many times people will get, get in there with a provider and they'll go, oh, this person is not for me. Um, and so counseling is not for me, right? And so I always like to say, you know, I don't like, I hate bubblegum ice cream, like, but there are a ton of ice cream flavors I do like, just bubblegum is disgusting to me. Um, and so, but just because I don't like bubblegum ice cream doesn't mean that ice cream isn't for me, right? So, um, so I always encourage people, like when you schedule your assessment, if you can schedule with five, three or five different providers, not on the same day, please don't schedule your assessments on the same day, that will cause you billing problems. But if you can kind of schedule those out over the next couple of weeks, right? Three, four weeks, give it some time you've then got a basis of comparison, right? And I'm always honest with uh, providers and say, look, I'm, I'm scheduling with different people because I want to find a good fit for me. Right? Sure. That is your right to do that. I always encourage that people do that. And some, and some providers, I would say probably more in private practice settings, but maybe other settings as well, sometimes are willing to connect with the person and do like a 10, 15 minute, discussion, you know, just to kind of get a sense if, you know, they at least have some expertise in the area and, and you can kind of get a sense if there's a vibe in the beginning, a good vibe or a not so good vibe um, in, in that time. But I also think it's up to therapists as well. And I, I know that when I worked as a therapist and I was doing an intake assessment, I would let people know, look, you know, we're going to go through a lot of questions and you can answer what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with, I understand, and we'll just work around that. But 
you know, it doesn't mean that I'm the right person for you. And so we can talk about that and make those decisions. And sometimes as a therapist, I knew that I probably wasn't a good fit for the person. And I may say to my supervisor, these are what I see as the person's sort of main focus. And, you know, I don't think that I fit the bill for what this person needs. So I think there's a dance. And I think, like you said, people need to understand that the dance exists. It's not rigid. And there is that flexibility because at the end of the day, you want to find the right fit for yourself. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of therapists will say those things and, and kind of, you know, hey, this is going to be really, this first one is going to be a ton of questions, right? I promise it's not going to always be like that. But not all therapists are going to say that to you. Sure. Right? So, so you know, as as the person going in, we get to to say that, even if we're not prompted to. Um, yeah. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, a lot of therapists will do that. I, I always think that's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. And, and I, and I, I guess I would sort of end this kind of topic with that, um, that, you know, it's worth, it's worth putting the energy in, um, to do this for yourself. And there's people, if you have an ear infection, um, if you, you know, stub your toe and break your toe, um, you go to the doctor and you get it addressed and there's still a lot of people feel like, you know, when your heart's broken or you're, you know, feeling emotional pain, um, or you're grieving, um, or, you know, you're experiencing other more intense symptoms that somehow those don't deserve the help. Um, and we have to change, we have to change how we think about mental health also because there's such a correlation between mental health and medical health, um, and they're really one in the same. And so, you know, I'm with you as far as advocating for people to get the help they need and, and, and then if you can't do it yourself, asking someone to help you do it. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes it's hard for you to do it for yourself. So yeah. find someone that can help you to get the help that you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And when, when, you know, talking with your support people around you, right. Um, it, it, it can be really helpful to have code words even with the people around you right and establish those uh when when you're feeling well establish those when uh, you know before before the child comes um to kind of have those code words available because sometimes we don't have the words to express <laughs> what it is but we still need help and, and asking for that help can be really hard so um yeah so i love uh, that idea it just again just preparation um for that yeah, absolutely. Mental health counseling is for everybody, just like dentistry. <laughs> dental health is for everybody. Uh, medical health is for everybody. And mental health counseling is for everybody. Um, and if, if you're listening to this episode and, and you have interest in, if you are in the, on the fence about starting mental health counseling or you have interest in learning more um, about why you need a counselor, you can listen to uh, my podcast. It's called You Need a Counselor. Uh, and we have new episodes every week. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing, you know, your, both your personal story and your professional and personal, I guess, recommendations, um, for people, um, who are in distress and, and need help and for people, um, sort of to also think about preparing themselves for when they're, you know, potentially going into more difficult transitions in their life. So, um, appreciate having you uh, today. Sure. Yes. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening. I hope you have another great week and I will talk to you next week. Be well.